two, one. We are on the air. Welcome to another episode of Run Talk. I'm your host, Dr. Jason Carp. On today's episode, we're going to talk about something that is so not just integral to running, but integral to life. We're going to talk about breathing. So we have a whole episode talking all about breathing while you run. And we'll talk about different situations about breathing when you're at sea level, when you're at altitude, how that changes, how what you should focus on breathing when you run. So today's episode is all about breathing. And we already have a bunch of guests in the room. Thank you for joining our studio audience. This is our 11th episode of Run Talk. So we've been doing this for uh, 11 Mondays now. And uh, we'll see. Hopefully we'll get to thousands of episodes. And then NBC or ABC or CBS will pick us up. And we'll get to be on the, the bigger TV screen in your living room. Wouldn't that be something? So let's get into it. Because uh, I see a lot of stuff on social media and on the Internet about breathing and w what people should do when they you know, focus on breathing when they run. So we're going to talk about, as we always do, we'll talk a little bit about the physiology of breathing and how we get oxygen inside of our bodies and ultimately to our skeletal muscle, then to the heart itself. And then we'll talk about what kinds of specific things that you should do. Hi, Christopher. Thank you for joining us again for another episode of Run Talk. And so uh, that's, what, that's what we'll talk about today. So we'll, we'll go through some of the physiology and talk about what this means for your running. So... Uh, let's first talk about the condition of sea level first, and then we'll get into altitude, because altitude complicates things a little bit, but it's fascinating. I love studying altitude and talking about altitude training. But first, we'll talk about sea level. So when you breathe in, you know, we have a lot of oxygen out here in the, in the environmental air. You can't see it. It's invisible. But there's a lot of oxygen molecules all over the air. And whether you are at a sea level or you are standing at the top of Mount Everest at 29,000, 29 feet, the amount of oxygen in the air is always the same. It is always 20.93% oxygen. And then uh, the red, you have some carbon dioxide in the air. You have uh, some inert nitrogen that's in the air. But uh, most of the air is actually, um, you know, we, we have a nitrogen. It doesn't get used inside the body. We breathe it in. We breathe it out. But uh, most of the air is carbon dioxide. And uh, we have just under 21% oxygen in the air. So we breathe in the air, we breathe in the oxygen, and it goes into, you know, through our nostrils or our mouth, and it goes into the lungs, and it goes into the, the alveoli of the lungs. So the alveoli are like these little sacs that are, they almost look like um, uh, broccoli, you know, the way that they're all scrunched up together, like the head of broccoli. That's what an alveoli almost looks like. That's what it reminds me of when you look at this, you know, or even cauliflower. Maybe cauliflower is a better analogy. It's this bundle of all this squished up tissue. And inside of all that tissue is a bunch of oxygen molecules. And the way it's, the reason it's done that way is, is unbelievable. The way humans are designed are so elegant. Why isn't it all spread out? Because if it were all spread out, it would take up a lot of room. And so the alveoli are like these little scrunched up sacs. If you were to unravel those scrunched up sacs and spread it all out, all the alveoli in the lungs, it would take up the size of a tennis court. It's actually quite large. So we can increase the surface area of our lungs that hold oxygen by scrunching up all these alveoli into these little sacs. And it takes up a lot less room that way. And so we have these very tiny sacs that are all scrunched up tissue, but the walls of the alveoli are less than paper thin. They're so thin, they're like the, the thinness of a hair. You take a little hair, I need a haircut. You take a little hair, they're the thinness of a hair. So we have this enormous area that's all scrunched up, but a very thin wall. Now, why is that important? Because oxygen and carbon dioxide have to be transferred across that wall. And so when you have a very thin wall over an enormous area that is scrunched up together, that is the perfect medium for carbon dioxide and oxygen gas exchange. And that is the goal. That is how the lungs work. The lungs don't really do any work. But what happens in the lungs is the passive diffusion, passive, not active. So that means it doesn't require energy to do this. It doesn't require ATP. It's the passive diffusion of oxygen and carbon dioxide across this wall. And so we'll get into in a few minutes what happens when 
we have inflammation in the lungs, which is what's going on now with COVID. And we're hearing all about these people who have to be on ventilators. We'll get to that because all of this, it relates. And so remember that there's a very thin wall under normal healthy conditions. You have this very thin wall over an enormous area that is condensed by making the alveoli look like that rather than look like spread out. So it takes up the size of a tennis court. How are you gonna fit a whole tennis court inside of your, your chest cavity? I know how, we're gonna scrunch up all that area. And so that's what evolution has designed for us or God has designed for us. An enormous area inside of our chest cavity that's all scrunched up so that we can have this enormous area and all this oxygen so we can diffuse it across this very thin paper thin wall, less than paper thin wall, and we can get it into the blood. So we get oxygen from the outside environment, and because it's sea level, we'll get to altitude in a few minutes, because it's sea level, the barometric pressure is such that there's a high pressure gradient, and that's important to remember, a high pressure gradient between the environmental air and the air inside my lungs. The pressure outside here in the air is much, much, much greater than the pressure inside my lung. And so what does that mean? Well, as you learned back in high school chemistry class, molecules move from area of high pressure to areas of low pressure, and an area of high concentration to low concentration. So the driving force for oxygen goes from outside here in the air, inside of our lungs, no problem at sea level because you have a huge driving force to get oxygen in, because the partial pressure of oxygen in the outside environment is much, much greater than what it is inside the lungs. So you don't even have to think about breathing at sea level. It automatically happens, and you get oxygen inside. So oxygen goes from the outside environment, it goes into your lungs, into those alveoli, into those little capillaries, little tiny blood vessels that perfuse those alveoli, it gets inside the, the oxygen in the, in the air, it gets inside the capillaries. From those, it goes into the pulmonary vein. So you have two large um, perfusions of the lungs. You have the pulmonary arteries on one side and the pulmonary veins on the other. So we go into the pulmonary vein. From the pulmonary vein, that oxygen, then, so now it's already into the bloodstream. It's diffused into the blood, into the capillaries, into the pulmonary vein. From the pulmonary vein, now the blood flow that's carrying the oxygen goes into the left atrium. And from the left atrium of your heart, it goes inside the largest chamber of the heart, the left ventricle. And then from the left ventricle, the blood and the oxygen contained in it, from the left ventricle goes the largest artery, the aorta. And from the aorta, we go through the large arteries, from the large arteries to the smaller arterioles, from the small arterioles to the very tiny capillaries that perfuse all of your internal organs and all of the muscle fibers. Then depending on how fast the pace you're running, the muscles will extract whatever oxygen it needs from those tiny capillaries to do the job that you're asking your muscles to do. Whether it's running at six minute mile pace or, or lifting very heavy weights or whatever is needed, your muscles will take up whatever amount of oxygen it needs to do the job. And then Whatever small amount of oxygen is left and a whole lot of carbon dioxide from metabolism goes back up the other way. We go through the tiny capillaries, then through the small venules, then from the small venules to the larger veins. From the largest, ve largest veins, we go into the largest vein of the body, the vena cava. We go up the, the bottom side, the inferior side of the vena cava, through the top side, the superior vena cava. And from the superior vena cava, we dump inside, we dump the blood inside the right atrium. And then from the right atrium, we go through the tricuspid valve, which takes us into the right ventricle, the right ventricle through the pulmonary artery, from the pulmonary artery, then we go through the tiny capillaries inside the, the lungs, inside the alveoli, and then we exhale that, we diffuse that into the air. So a passive diffusion, it has to be passive. Passive diffusion, we exhale the carbon dioxide, and again, we inhale the oxygen, and then we start that whole circuit all over again. So it's a very elegant circuit starting from when you inhale oxygen and it goes into the pulmonary vein and then through the, the left side of the heart and then through this, what's called the systemic or body circulation. And then we go back into the right side of the heart before we go in back into the lungs. So it's this really elegant circuit. So why is that important? Well, for one thing, anytime you have some kind of pathology that causes a problem in any one of those steps, that's going to hurt your ability to ultimately get oxygen from the lungs to 
the, the muscles to do the work, to hold the pace that you're trying to hold. And so getting back to what I talked about earlier about the uh, small, the large area with a tiny, thin, paper-thin, hair-thin wall, the reason why that's important is because any pathology that causes inflammation in the lungs, like the virus that's spreading right now, will thicken that wall. Any kind of inflammation will thicken that wall. And if we thicken that wall, then that decreases the diffusion capacity of oxygen and carbon dioxide to release carbon dioxide and to get in oxygen. And so any kind of time you have any kind of lung disease or bronchitis or you know, asthma or the COVID-19, any time you have some kind of disease in the lungs, any kind of respiratory illness that causes inflammation in the lungs that will increase the, the width, the thickness of that wall because there's fluid filled up in there. That's the inflammation. You get fluid in the lungs and it in effect thickens the, the wall of the alveoli. And so that decreases the diffusion capacity. We can measure this in the lab. We call this the DLO2 and the DLCO2, the lungs diffusion capacity for oxygen and for carbon dioxide. All this stuff can be measured in the lab. And so that's why a lot of patients right now have to be on ventilators to breathe for them because there's so much inflammation in their lungs that they can't breathe themselves. They can't diffuse that oxygen. And so we have to bypass the lungs' ability to do that by putting them on a ventilator, which will get oxygen into the blood and force that, you know, increase the pressure gradient to, to force oxygen into the blood. So that's a little bit of background about uh, how we breathe. And so, like I said, at sea level, we have no problem getting air in because of the huge pressure difference between the outside environment and inside of our lungs. So I hear lots of times coaches and even people who claim to be coaches, they're all over social media. And you see people say that when you run, you should focus on taking deeper breaths because we get in more oxygen that way. If that's what you're doing, I feel sorry for you because that is not how you get more oxygen to the muscles that need it. Ultimately, the goal is to get more oxygen to the skeletal muscles and to the heart itself. The heart is a muscle that also needs its own oxygen supply. That's why we have these very large coronary arteries. You know, if you look at a picture of the heart, it's you have arteries that surround the heart. You have vessels itself that surround the heart because the heart needs its own oxygen supply to be able to contract and, and do its job to pump blood. And so if you take deeper breaths, you're not getting in any more oxygen into your blood because at sea level, your blood is nearly 100% saturated with oxygen, even when you're running really, really hard, even when you're running a race. And uh, the reason for that is because of the pressure difference. So remember I just talked about how the partial pressure of oxygen outside in the environment is much greater than the oxygen pressure in the lungs, or the PO2, the partial pressure of oxygen in the lungs. The same is true as we go, remember that circuit I just talked about, as we go from the left ventricle into the major arteries, into the smaller arterioles, into the capillaries that perfuse your muscle fibers, as we go down that, those, that staircase, as we go from the lungs to the muscles, the partial pressure of oxygen decreases. And it has to be that way in order for oxygen to move through your body from the lungs all the way down to your muscles and all your other organs that need oxygen. The PO2 will decrease as we go down this staircase, and that is called the oxygen cascade. We have this whole cascade of events that goes on to get oxygen from the lungs down to the skeletal muscles. And we do that by changing the pressure, because remember, as I talked about a few minutes ago, molecules move from areas of high pressure to areas of low pressure. And so when the pressure is lowest, the PO2 of the muscle must be lower than the PO2 of the lungs, which must be lower than the PO2 of the environment. Otherwise, oxygen wouldn't go that way. And so when you get oxygen into your lungs, when you get your blood oxygen saturation checked, you know, we can check this. A lot of people now, you know, have these things they put on their finger at home. When you go to the doctor's office, when they check their vital, when the nurse checks your vital signs, one of the things that they will do is put that little clip on your finger to measure the blood oxygen saturation. 
Now, it's not a direct measurement. To do a direct measurement, we have to be pretty invasive, and we have to put some kind of probe inside your artery and measure. We can't do that. That's too invasive. How are we going to subject everybody to that? So we have this incredible concept that we use to estimate the blood oxygen saturation. It has to do with the properties of hemoglobin. So you have hemoglobin in your blood, which is the protein that carries oxygen. I said this on another show, I think, we talked about VO2 max and cardiovascular physiology, but it relates to this, too. That hemoglobin has a, what's called a quaternary shape. It's got a quaternary structure. It has four subunits. And when hemoglobin is fully saturated with oxygen, it's got four oxygen molecules on each of the subunits, and it, it takes on a certain shape. When oxygen is not bound to hemoglobin, when you have a dissociation of oxygen from hemoglobin, then say you only have three oxygen molecules on the four subunits, the, the molecule of hemoglobin will change shape. And the same thing will happen when there's only two molecules of oxygen attached to hemoglobin, change shape again. And when there's only one molecule, change shape again. So the quaternary structure of hemoglobin changes shape when based on how many molecules of oxygen are attached to it. And if you look inside that little clip that they put on your finger, if you look inside of that thing, there's a little infrared light. So red light in there. And so what that red light, what that infrared light is measuring is the refraction of that light. We're measuring the, the refraction of that light based on the shape of hemoglobin. Because when hemoglobin changes shape, it refracts light differently. It looks different. It takes on a different refractive pattern of the light. And so based on that, we can then estimate how many molecules of oxygen are attached to the hemoglobin, and it has its calculation inside of that thing, and it tells you the percent oxygen saturation. Like if there's only three molecules attached, it'd be 75 percent saturated. That's already getting very low. And so if you notice when you put that thing on your finger, if you look at the monitor, or you ask the nurse who's measuring it, what was my blood oxygen saturation? The nurse, depending on where you are living, but if you're at sea level, it should be about 98 percent. It's not quite 100%. Why? We already know why. We just talked about it. Because the PO2 must drop a little bit from the environmental air to inside your lungs and into your blood. It has to drop. The PO2 has to drop as we're going down this oxygen cascade so that the driving force of oxygen is in the direction that we want it to go. So once the oxygen gets into your lungs and it gets into your blood, the PO2 is not going to be 100. The saturation is not going to be 100 anymore. It's going to be slightly less. It'll be about 98% at sea level. Then the higher up you go in altitude, the lower it will be. It will start to come down. So when you're at about 5,000 feet of altitude, it'll be about 95, 96% saturated. When you go to 10,000 feet and higher, it's not linear decrease, though. It's a curvilinear decrease. So like when you're standing, I don't even know what it is at the top of Mount Everest, but it's very low. And that's why it's very hard to climb Mount Everest without some supplemental oxygen. You have to uh, take supplemental oxygen because the pressure difference, when you're standing at the top of Mount Everest, 29,000, 29 feet, the pressure difference in oxygen between the outside environment and your lungs is so small that you don't have this driving force anymore. So it's almost like you got to be on a ventilator when you're at the top of Mount Everest. It's the same concept to get in more oxygen into the lungs. And so when you're at sea level, you'll notice you put that clip on your finger and measure the refractive pattern of light based on the shape of hemoglobin, based on the oxygen saturation of hemoglobin, and we can estimate what the blood oxygen saturation is without doing anything invasive. How cool is that? All based on the, the uh, quaternary structure and how that structure changes, how the protein changes shape of hemoglobin based on how saturated it is with oxygen. So clever, so clever. Whoever invented that pulse, pull a pulse oximeter Whoever, measured, whoever invented that, brilliant. I wish I could have invented something like that. That is brilliant. Understanding the, the properties of hemoglobin and then how we can measure how much oxygen is saturated into your, onto the hemoglobin inside your blood. The foundation of all creative work starts from expertise. Expertise is the foundation of all creative work. If you are not an expert, it's hard to be creative and come up with ideas. You have to understand the science in order to be able to come up with the ideas of, of how things work and then be able to, in this case, invent a pulse oximeter. So clever. All right, so let's, we're not going to get off topic here. So the point is that you don't have to take deeper breaths when you're running because that's not going to get more oxygen into the blood. How are you going to get more oxygen to the muscles that it needs? Because ultimately that's, what the, that's what's important is getting the oxygen to the muscles. There's a cardiovascular responsibility. We increase our heart rate, 
we increase our stroke volume, which is the volume of blood pumped per beat. We take the stroke volume, which is the volume per beat, and we multiply that by the heart rate, beats per minute, and we get cardiac output, the volume per minute. And that's our body's mechanism for driving more blood and the oxygen contained in it to the muscles that need it to be able to run at a faster pace. It has nothing to do with how much oxygen is inside your lungs. The partial pressure of oxygen is what is driving all of this, and the blood is nearly 100% saturated with oxygen at sea level, even when you're running a race. Now, when you go to a higher altitude, the situation changes a little bit because the barometric pressure outside here is lower. And so because the barometric, or you could say atmospheric pressure is lower, then the partial pressure of oxygen is lower. Still 20.93% oxygen, no matter where you are, but the partial pressure now is lower of oxygen. And so you have a decreased driving force to get oxygen from the environment inside your P-shaped nostrils and into your lungs, less of a driving force. And so the first thing you'll notice when you go to altitude is you breathe more to compensate for that. You'll start to take more breaths to compensate for the fact that with each breath, you're getting less oxygen in because the driving force is less. And so especially when you do a workout at altitude, you'll notice you'll breathe quite heavily. And that is to make up for the fact or to compensate for the fact that you are getting less oxygen in with each breath because of the decreased partial pressure of oxygen. Always remember molecules move from an area of higher pressure to an area of lower pressure. And so the higher up in altitude you go, the less the pressure difference, and that's what matters, is the pressure difference between the atmospheric or barometric air, the atmospheric air, the environmental air, and the air inside of your lungs. And so taking deeper breaths could have some negative consequences when, even when you're running at sea level because your breathing muscles, you know, the diaphragm and the intercostal muscles, you know, the, the inhalation requires, you know, breathing muscles, exhalation is, a, is an elastic recoil, so it doesn't take as much muscle activity to breathe the air out as it does to breathe the air in. It takes more muscle activity to breathe the air in. The diaphragm has to work a lot and the intercostal muscles, the muscles in between the costal cartilages of your ribs. That's why it's called intercostal muscles. It refers to between the ribs. You have little muscles in between the ribs, and those muscles have to work to breathe the air in. And so when you take deeper breaths, you could theoretically be stealing oxygen away from the muscles that need it, from the leg muscles that, to try to hold the pace. Because imagine, you have a, a certain volume, you know, we talked about this two seconds ago, the cardiac output. You have a certain volume of, of, of blood and oxygen contained in it. You have, a certainly you have a certain volume of blood being pumped every minute. That volume, that cardiac output is partitioned all over the place depending on what needs it. Your brain will take a fraction of the cardiac output. Your heart itself will take a fraction of the cardiac output. All your internal organs that need blood supply constantly throughout the day. They'll take a fraction of the cardiac output, and your skeletal muscles will take a fraction of that cardiac output. And so we have to partition, we have to spread that cardiac output all over the body based on what the demands are at the moment. And so if you're taking deeper breath because you think you're getting in more oxygen by doing that, now some of the breathing muscles will take some of that cardiac output. Some of that cardiac output will now be partitioned and distributed to those breathing muscles because now you're asking the breathing muscles to expand your chest cavity and do more work. You don't want that because you want the blood, you want as much of that blood flow going to the skeletal muscles of your legs as possible because that's what's going to help you hold a faster pace. It's all about getting as much blood flow to the leg muscles as possible so that they can work, so that they can contract and, and hold a faster pace. They need the oxygen supply to be able to regenerate ATP for muscle contraction through aerobic metabolism. Once they meet their aerobic metabolic limits, you're going to start to rely more on anaerobic metabolism, and then fatigue is imminent. We'll talk about metabolism on another show. That's a good topic for another show. Talk all about metabolism. So anytime you hear somebody say, take deeper breaths, belly breathe, you hear that a lot, belly breathe, got to belly breathe. Don't listen to that. These people don't know what they're talking about. you got to study pulmonary physiology to understand what's going on here. Don't listen to those people. 
to pick up a textbook, study pulmonary physiology. It's fascinating, pulmonary physiology, and how it relates to, that's why sometimes you hear the term cardiorespiratory physiology, because respiration is completely linked to cardiovascular. Those two things go together. So lots of times we hear, instead of just talking about cardiovascular physiology or pulmonary physiology, we combine them into cardiorespiratory physiology because the cardiovascular system is so closely linked because how do we get the oxygen we breathe in all over the place? We get it through the cardiovascular system. That is our transport mechanism. So they're completely intertwined, these two things. That's why I have to talk about them together. So don't worry about taking deeper breaths when you're running because all that's going to do is potentially steal some of that cardiac output and redistribute it to the, the breathing muscle. You actually want to breathe as little as possible to run at a given pace. You want as less muscular work up here as possible because the, the muscles up here that are the intercostal muscles, the diaphragm, you want them to do as little work as possible so that more of the cardiac out, output can be distributed to the leg muscles and you can run at a faster pace. So that's why that's important. So what else can we cover about breathing? You don't really have to think about breathing. You know, oh, here's another one. You know, I have no script. I'm not reading off a cue card, so I've got to remember all this stuff off the top of my head that I want to talk about. I'm speaking totally off the top of my head. But uh, it's fascinating because I never know what's going to come out. So another thing I always hear is that uh, people get out of breath. They feel like their lungs are limiting their performance. You know, I hear all the time, oh, I'm out of breath. It's the lungs that are my legs can go forever, but my lungs are limiting me. That's nonsense. The lungs are not limiting you. For one thing, the lungs don't, like I said before, the lungs don't work. The lungs are just this medium for the, the passive diffusion of oxygen and carbon dioxide. Oxygen goes in, carbon dioxide goes out through this thin hair-like wall, and, and all is good. The lungs don't work. They don't have a job to do. They're not active, pa they're, they're passive structures, but it's just what happens in the lungs that is what lets us live and what lets us um, run faster, as the case may be. But your lungs don't limit your running performance. The reason why people feel out of breath when they run is because of the carbon dioxide. So at sea level, we'll talk about altitude in a second because the situation changes a little bit, but at sea level, the major reason to breathe, the main stimulus to breathe is the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the blood. And so when you run faster, this is why you run, you breathe more when you do an interval workout, because through metabolism, especially through anaerobic metabolism, we increase the amount of carbon dioxide. We produce a lot of carbon dioxide in metabolism. And I can get to in a second why we do that, especially through anaerobic metabolism. We produce a lot of carbon dioxide. And so the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the blood will increase. When that happens, we are stimulated through a lot of mechanisms, baroreceptors and chemoreceptors that are inside of our body. We sense, we have what's called chemoreceptors. They sense the chemistry. They re are receptive to chemistry. And that's why they're called chemoreceptors. And so we have chemoreceptors in our blood vessels and throughout our body that sense the chemistry. And when the PCO2 goes up, that can drop the pH of the blood and of organs. And so we are stimulated to breathe more to release that carbon dioxide into the environment. And so that's very elegant system that we have these sensors inside of our body because to increase the CO2 inside of our body, that could be that you could die from that. You know, you don't want CO2 production to get too high. You have to exhale that through the lung. And so we exhale the CO2. Now, when you go into higher altitude, very high altitudes especially, because of the decrease in partial pressure of oxygen in the environment, now it's a combination. Now our stimulus to breathe is a combination of the PCO2 in your blood and the decreased PO2 of the environment. And so now we're going to inhale more and exhale. We're going to inhale more because of the getting more oxygen and exhale more to get rid of the, uh, the PCO2. And so it's a combination of the PO2 and PCO2 when you go to high altitude. But at sea level, the PCO2 in the blood is the main driver of, of the breathing, of the exhalation. The reason, let's get back to this, let's link all these concepts so that you understand. The reason why you breathe more during a hard workout is because there is more reliance on anaerobic metabolism. And when you run really fast, you increase hydrogen ion production. So we're going to link hydrogen ion production to the CO2.
we don't produce CO2 directly, we produce hydrogen ions. And that comes also from the, the you know, breaking apart of ATP that gets into a lot of biochemistry. It's fascinating, but it's outside the scope of, of the show. So let's keep it simple. So when you exercise hard, you increase hydrogen ion production. That decreases the pH. Remember back to high school biology and chemistry class, you learned about pH. So when you drop the pH, it's because of an increase in hydrogen ion production. And so when we increase hydrogen ion production, we have to buffer those hydrogens to get acid-base balance back to normal because our body does not like an acidic environment. And so when we drop the pH because of an increase in hydrogen ion, we have to buffer those hydrogen ions. Our buffer of the hydrogen ions is bicarbonate, HCO3. And so when we take H plus HCO3, we get H2CO3, that's carbonic acid. And when we get H2CO3, immediately that breaks apart. What do you think H2CO3 breaks apart into? You're right, H2O and CO2. And so that's the link between the breathing and the increased hydrogen ion production from running fast. We increase hydrogen ions, which have to be buffered, we buffer those hydrogens with HCO3, and we produce water, H2O, and CO2. And that increase in CO2 then drives the, stimulates us to breathe, it drives the breathing, we exhale out the CO2. And so that's why you breathe more. So when people say, oh, I'm so out of breath when I run, it's because they're increasing the amount of CO2 production because they're not as aerobically fit and so when you're not as aerobically fit, you start to rely more on anaerobic metabolism to supply the energy for muscle contraction. And we produce hydrogens, which then are buffered and produce CO2. And then what do you know? Oh, I'm out of breath. I'm breathing more. And so that's why people breathe more. But the more fit you become, the more aerobically fit you become, you'll notice you can maintain a faster pace without breathing as hard because now you're supplying all that energy through aerobic metabolism, not producing as much CO2, and you're not breathing as hard. And that's why all runners will breathe much harder when they do an interval workout compared to when they're just going out the door for an easy run. And so that's the link between running harder and being out of breath. And so my response to people who always say, oh, my lungs are limiting me. Well, it's not your lungs. Your, the blood is already 100% saturated with oxygen. It's not the lungs that are limiting you. It's metabolism inside the muscle that's limiting you. Because when you're not as fit, you start to rely more on anaerobic metabolism, and then that ultimately drives the breathing. And so people perceive that the lungs are limiting them. Interestingly, the lungs only limit performance in world-class runners who have reached their genetic potential of all the other attributes, all the other characteristics. And then you could argue that in those athletes who have reached the uppermost genetic limit for mitochondrial density and capillarization and blood volume and all the other characteristics, enzyme function, all the other characteristics that influence performance, when you have reached that genetic limit, then you can argue, well, what's lagging behind now? Now it could be the lungs lagging behind. But in 99.9999% of the population, the lungs are not lagging behind all these other characteristics. It's all the other characteristics that are lagging behind. The lungs are already doing a fantastic job of the passive diffusion of oxygen and carbon dioxide. The lung, you don't have to worry about what's happening in the lung. Unless, going back to what I said before, unless you have some kind of inflammation in the lungs and some pathology then that's a different story altogether. Then you need medical intervention to be able to increase oxygen diffusion across that now thicker wall. Remember the wall? It always comes back to the wall. You want a very thin wall over an enormous area to enhance oxygen diffusion. And so uh, it's only in people who have some, what's called a diffusion limitation. If you read the scientific research, you'll see that term a lot, diffusion limitation in the lungs. That only happens when you have some kind of pathology in the lungs or anything that would cause inflammation in the lungs or damage to the, the walls or the alveoli, you know, then you'll get a diffusion limitation because now you have a thicker wall that oxygen and carbon dioxide have to cross, over, cross through rather than a very paper thin wall that oxygen and carbon dioxide have to pass through. Wouldn't you want a paper thin wall than a thick wall? Of course you would. Faster, quicker diffusion of oxygen across that wall if it's paper thin than if it's thick. And so 
you've got to stay, the, the bottom line to that is stay away from inflammation in the lungs because that's how it affects oxygen diffusion, thickens the wall. Stay away from in, inflammation of the lung. Wear a mask. Stay away from inflammation. So you don't have to focus on your breathing. The breathing is not limiting you. In healthy people with no lung pathology, your lungs are not limiting your performance because already you have 100% or nearly 100% saturation of oxygen in the blood as it's flowing to your skeletal muscles so that you can run. So we can get to some questions. Um, just run and don't think. Then say, yeah, exactly. You know, I mean, you really don't have to think about your breathing. It's amazing to me how much uh, commotion is about breathing when you run. You know, you have passive diffusion, and it's very elegant, and you don't have to think about the breathing when you run. Certainly don't think about taking deeper breaths. You know, that's not going to do the job. You know, you don't have to think about that. Now, when you go to altitude, yeah, you, you have to think about that. It's on your mind more. It's you know, more obvious that you're breathing more heavily when you go to altitude because of the less partial pressure difference between the environment and your lungs, and so you, you will breathe a lot more. But at sea level, there is not a problem. So uh, I'm trying to think, what else can we talk about? Lungs. Uh, another thing we can talk about is, so uh, again, going back to elite athletes who have maximized their genetic potential and all the other characteristics. And so the lungs could be lagging behind that. And so then you could say the lungs are a limiting factor. The other issue with uh, elite athletes is that they are, de some of them, not, not all of them, but about half, about half, I measured this during my, uh, my doctoral dissertation, actually, that uh, about half of elite runners will desaturate their oxygen from hemoglobin because they have such a high cardiac output. Remember the, the picture I painted for you in the beginning of the show where we talk about the circuits and how oxygen is getting from the air into the lungs, then from the lungs through the, the systemic circulation. Well, imagine if you have a very, very high cardiac output. Imagine if your cardiac output is like at elite levels. For men, about 40 liters per minute when at max. For women, slightly less, 30 to 35 liters per minute at max. Imagine if, you know, when you have an enormous amount of blood being coming into the lungs, you have less time. Because you have such a high cardiac output, a lot of elite athletes, they have less time for oxygen to be picked up by hemoglobin as it passes through the pulmonary capillaries, you know, pulmonary vein, pulmonary capillaries, the blood circulation inside the lungs. Ultimately, you can imagine this as kind of like a conveyor belt. You have blood coming through the pulmonary vein, and you have oxygen in the out being held in the sacs and the alveoli in the lungs. And as blood is running through the pulmonary vein, the hemoglobin inside of there, it's got to like pick up the oxygen from the alveoli so then it can go into the, the left atrium and the left ventricle and through the systemic circulation. So you have blood that's rushing through the pulmonary vein, it's going through. If the blood is going slowly through the pulmonary vein, that gives more time for the oxygen inside those little sacs of the alveoli. That gives more time for oxygen to attach on to the hemoglobin as hemoglobin is going through. But imagine now if you have a very, very high cardiac output you have more blood per minute being, sh you know, being shunted everywhere, and you have a faster delivery, you have a faster blood flow through the pulmonary vein. Now hemoglobin is passing by at a much quicker rate. It doesn't have as much time to pick up all the oxygen molecules as blood is passing by. And that's the situation. That's called the transit time, the red blood cell transit, the hemoglobin is inside the red blood cell. We call that the red blood cell transit time. The time that red blood cells are passing through the vasculature, the blood inside the lungs. We call that the red blood cell transit time. And so the transit time is less in an elite runner who's got a huge cardiac output. And so that's why in about half of elite runners, we see what's called exercise-induced hypoxemia. The lack of blood flow, the lack of oxygen the hypoxic condition, so lack of oxygen is hypoxia, and emia refers to blood flow. Anemia, people have heard of anemia, you know, a lot of, you know, lack of iron in the blood because of lack of blood. So we get to, we combine these terms and we get hypoxemia, lack of oxygen through blood flow in the lungs. The language of all this is, it can be confusing, but it's weird how uh, it all gets put together. So hypoxemia is lack of oxygen 
from blood flow, from a quick blood flow inside the lungs. And so it's exercise induced. And so we call that exercise induced hypoxemia. And so about half of elite endurance athletes show this exercise induced hypoxemia. And so they desaturate, their hemoglobin concentration is slightly desaturated compared to people who don't have such large cardiac outputs in a short transit time. So it's fascinating. I got to measure some of that during my uh, dissertation research. It was very interesting. So that's another thing that we uh, that uh, we can mention about uh, you know again, only in the, the point here is that only in elite endurance athletes can you make the claim that the lungs are limiting their performance, or in other people who have some kind of lung pathology where you have a diffusion limitation in the lungs. But assuming healthy lungs, assuming no inflammation in the lungs, then don't worry about your lungs. The lungs are not limiting performance. The lungs also don't really get trained the way muscles get trained. You know, you can't increase the number of alveoli in the lungs. Boy, if you could, that would enhance oxygen diffusion. I mean, that would be great. But you're not increasing the amount of alveoli in the lungs. You're not changing the uh, the diffusion capacity based on the size of the wall, the thickness of the wall. The other thing about the lungs, people think that you know if you have large lungs, it can hold more air and you can get in more oxygen. That also is false. If you look at the best runners in the world, aren't they quite small people? Yeah, they are. They have small people and small lungs. And one of the other things I've measured in the lab is uh, the, the vital capacity, the amount of oxygen, the air, the amount of air the lungs can hold. It's called your vital capacity. And then we add the vital capacity to residual lung volume, how much volume is in the lungs after a complete exhalation. And we add those together and we get total lung capacity. And so if you look at total lung capacity or vital capacity inside the lungs, then uh, small people have a smaller vital capacity than larger people. But larger people are not the best runners, are they? Smaller people tend to be or not even tend to be, they are the best runner, distance runners. And so the, even though the vital capacity, the amount of lung capacity in the lungs is smaller in smaller people, they're still better runners because it has nothing to do with how big your lungs are and how much air your lungs can hold. If that were true, then the largest people with the largest lungs would be the best distance runners, and that's not true. It all has to do with the cardiovascular system's ability to transport the blood that contains the oxygen. And it has nothing to do with the size of the lungs. I remember doing this, uh, my doctoral dissertation measured the, the coordination of breathing and stride rate, and I looked at vital capacity, I'm looking at also you know, pulmonary function and how that affected the, uh, the coordination of breathing and stride rate. And the best runner I tested was a Kenyan runner, a pretty small guy, and he had the lowest vital capacity of all my subjects, even though he was by far the best runner. So it's funny to me when people think that, you know, it's all about how much air your lungs can hold. And it's nothing, running performance has nothing to do with that. There is no relationship at all. There's no correlation between the vital capacity and how fast you run a marathon or how fast you run a 5K. It has nothing to do with that. So uh, what else can we talk about? Um, let's see, any questions? There's a lot of people in the room. Hi, everybody. I can't scroll through all the things to see the questions. Someone from India. Oh, hi from India. I have not been to India yet. I want to go. Maybe after this whole thing, as the pandemic is over, I'll take a trip to India. Uh, there's a lot of people in my certification course in India, so I want to go over there and actually teach the course. That would be phenomenal to be able to do that. A lot of people take the online course in India. It's great. Love it. So there you go, all about the lungs. So number one, don't focus on your breathing and take deeper breaths, when you're, especially when you're at sea level. There's no reason to do that. You're already getting plenty of oxygen into the, the lungs and into the, the blood. You don't need to do that. Uh, someone at Joanne said, hi, I think I have exercise-induced asthma. Yeah, so that would be one of the conditions. So if you have exercise-induced asthma, then uh, you may need a bronchodilator. You know, that's why it's called a bronchodilator. It dilates the bronchioles that are part of the alveoli. So if you look at a picture, I wish I had a picture I could show you. If you look at a picture of the alveoli, again, it looks like a cauliflower or something like that, or the head of broccoli. And at the end of those, you have these bronchioles which uh, are help with the, the diffusion of oxygen. And so if you have asthma, you get a constriction of those bronchioles. Same thing like when you have bronchitis, you have an inflammation of the bronchioles. And so you need a bronchodilator to dilate and open up those bronchioles 
so that you can enhance oxygen diffusion. It's all about oxygen diffusion. Fascinating. So yes, if you have exercise-induced asthma, you know, I've uh, known a lot of runners who have exercise-induced asthma, and a lot of elite athletes who have exercise-induced asthma. So it won't hurt your performance, but uh, you might need to take a, a bronchodilator, which in most cases would be a steroid, like albuterol is a common steroid in bronchodilators for asthmatics. So uh, you could be on steroids, you could tell people I'm taking steroids. If you're on bronchodilator that has a steroid in it, you could say I'm taking steroids. Uh, okay, if there's any other questions, you know, I will post this stuff, you know, I'll answer questions in the in the, the list of comments and things. You know, feel free to ask questions. I'm always available for questions. I use an inhaler. Does that work? Yeah, so an inhaler, that's what it is. It's in, you're, inha you're inhaling something. It's a bronchodilator. So look at the ingredients on the inhaler, Joanne. Look at the ingredients, and it'll probably say albuterol or some other kind of steroid that's in the bronchodilator, but that's what an inhaler is, yeah. So you have this thing, you inhale it in your mouth, it goes in, and it's supposed to dilate the bronchioles to open it up so that you can enhance diffusion of oxygen across the membrane, you know, so that you, in effect, make the, you increase the surface area of those bronchioles. Very cool. Hope I answer the question. So at the uh, end of every show, you know, so the, now you have to know everything about breathing before we get to the end of the show. So now you know everything about breathing. You know, you breathe more when you work harder because of the increase in CO2, but breathing is not where you really need to focus on when you run, especially at sea level because you have no problem inhaling in the air at sea level. So another another show we could talk all about altitude if you want. You know, say, tell me what you know what things you want to know about running and you know we have uh, we have fifty two episodes a year, we'll deal with this. So we can talk about anything. So if you're just joining us, boy you missed a lot. So uh, hopefully you'll watch the, the show if you're just joining us. This is a run talk. I'm your host, Dr. Jason Carr. And uh, the thought that I will leave you with I'm going to do a little bit of a promo because, uh, hey, this is my show. I can promote whatever I want. Today in the mail, I got the my author copies of my brand new book, Lose It Forever, The Six Habits of Successful Weight Losers from the National Weight Control Registry. So a completely different topic. It was nice today. I got the book in my hand for the first time. All I've seen up till today is the PDF file, all the page proofs and everything I've gone through from the publisher. But today I actually see the book. So the official release date of the book is tomorrow. And so go on Amazon if you want to lose weight or you know people, you have friends, everybody's got a friend who wants to lose weight. This book goes over the all the research from the National Weight Control Registry, which is the largest database in the world on people who have lost weight and have kept it off forever. And so I urge you to get the book. It's each chapter is framed. I start and finish the chapter with a story of somebody who is in the National Weight Control Registry to balance their stories with the data and all the research. Pretty cool, I love it. So uh, there's a lot of great information. And so that gets me to my final thought of the, of the day, of the show. Read. You know, a lot of people in these days, they want little bits of information off of Facebook and Instagram. They just want to have a question answered. They just want to know X. You can't replace reading a book cover to cover. The enormous amount of information that you will learn from studying books you can't replace that. You won't get that off of little tidbits on social media, especially when most people talk on social media, they don't know what they're talking about. And so you got to read books by people who have credentials. Remember when you were back in high school and college, all your textbooks, which you may have not have read back then, but all your textbooks were written by people who were experts, documented experts in their subject. And that's how you learned. And you learned from the teacher and the professor and the textbook. And so I urge you to read. Don't be afraid of reading. Sit down with a book in your hand and open it up and read. My, re my writing is pretty entertaining, if I do say so myself. And so you're going to not only be entertained, you're going to learn a hell of a lot. And then one day you could come in to be a viewer of my show and say, you know what, Jason, I knew all of that, what you just talked about because I read a lot. Wouldn't that be empowering? And that's what I would urge everybody to do. Read, 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 read. Books, cover to cover. Don't just read a page. Read the books cover to cover and learn from scientists who know what they're talking about. And you can become an expert yourself. And that's empowering. And then you can come up with your own invention, like the pulse oximeter. Whoever, i got to look up who invented the pulse oximeter. So brilliant. 
but expertise is the foundation of all creative work. If you're not an expert, you can't create things like a pulse oximeter, putting that thing on your finger and knowing the blood oxygen saturation. The person who came up with that must have known a lot about oxygen saturation and hemoglobin. And that's the only way for that person to have come up with that and be creative like that. So that's my final thought for the day. Thank you for joining us. Come back next week for another episode of Run Talk. I'm your host, Dr. Jason Carp. Have a great week. Bye for now.